Both communist and UN forces fought the Korean War largely with surplus World War II weapons. A sometimes unappreciated fact is that at the start of the Korean War, the U.S. actually had not developed any new conventional weapons due to a complete cessation of procurement for ground warfare following World War II. Harry Truman's Defense Department was convinced that nuclear weapons meant the last major ground wars had been fought. This new technology had virtually emasculated American ground combat forces. Truman's Secretaries of Defense, James Forrestal and Lewis Johnson, not only stopped the development of new infantry arms and communications, but forced a change in Army training methods, shaping it to produce civilians wearing uniforms rather than professional soldiers prepared to face combat and death, should that be necessary. General Omar Bradley and the Joint Chiefs of Staff were scathingly contemptuous of the Navy and Marine Corps. They believed that there would never again be a major amphibious assault. In this atmosphere, Johnson also reduced the Marine Corps to a poorly equipped skeleton of its supposed strength, about six fighting battalions equipped with worn-out World War II weapons. In another blunder, Truman's Secretary of State, Dean Acheson, even left South Korea out of our defined sphere of world interests. To Stalin and Mao, this was a virtual invitation to include it in their own. Now China had gone through a major civil war and that was another big issue because the communists drove the nationalist forces of Chiang Kai-shek to the island of Formosa, which we call Taiwan today. And uh, all of mainland China became red China in 1949. So the world was set in a stage and to top everything off in February of 1950, the Soviet Union and Red China signed a 30-year perpetual agreement of friendship between Mao Zedong and Joe Stalin. And we really didn't know what that said. In the communist conspiracy ridden late 40s, early 50s, this seemed to be the indication of a red wall being built around America. In our eyes, right now, Red China and the Soviet Union are pretty much together. And this was something, these were the two largest communist countries in the world. And that was something that we were setting the political stage for this particular invasion that eventually would come in June. Although newer infantry weapons, radios, and vehicles had either been developed or were in production on both sides, they were all largely withheld from the units in Asia. The communist bloc, fighting through its secondary powers, followed the same course in employing old or obsolescent weaponry as did the United States. However, many communist arms were of a more recent manufacture or in better condition than those in American and rock hands in 1950. For example, although the burp gun was very effective in the close infantry assaults, it was not equal to the AK-47, a Soviet standard by 1949. From the infantry point of view, the Korean War was an anachronism. No milestone military developments arose from the war. The U.S. took innovative measures in logistical techniques, cold weather clothing, and battlefield medical assistance, MASH Mobile Army Surgical Hospital Units, but the only significantly new developments were the use of helicopters for reconnaissance, transport, and evacuation on a large scale, and the employment of jet aircraft in combat. The most modern American jet, the F-86 Sabre, was deployed only when the communist forces first introduced their MiG-15. As in America hoped for a long period of peace after the Second World War, the communists thought otherwise. The communists considered war a basic tool for expanding their ideology and ground warfare became the primary choice for combat when the alternative was world nuclear destruction. The Americans discovered that arming the rocks with satchel charges and grenades didn't really give them much defense against tanks. The rocks died by the hundreds under the steel treads of T-34s and the best of their 1950 army never got back south of the Han. Then, ready or not, 
Truman sent our men in uniform with their own obsolescent weapons into one of the most vicious infantry wars our country has ever fought. With the exception of Commonwealth forces, which used British issue arms, the following were the principal infantry weapons used by both sides of the Korean War. The M1 Garand, officially the United States rifle, caliber 30 M1, was the first semi-automatic rifle to be generally issued to the infantry of any nation. Called the greatest battle implement ever devised by General George S. Patton, the Garand officially replaced the bolt-action M1903 Springfield as the standard service rifle of the United States Armed Forces in 1936. The M1 was used heavily by U.S. forces in World War II, the Korean War, and to a limited extent, the Vietnam War. The M1's semi-automatic operation gave United States forces a significant advantage in firepower and shot-to-shot -shot recovery time over individual enemy infantrymen in battle. Criticisms of the M1 are its weight, limited ammunition supply, and that single rounds could not be pushed in. Also, the spent clip was automatically ejected after the last round was fired, making a distinctive sound, which could be fatal in close quarters or sniper operations. As a supplement to the Garand, the M1 carbine was developed. It was totally different in design philosophy with a smaller, less powerful cartridge and an effective range of 300 yards max. It weighed almost exactly half that of the M1 Garand, in many ways, you could think of the M1 carbine as a modestly powerful, two-handed, long-barreled auto pistol with a shoulder stock. The M1 and M2 carbines were much more powerful than the Russian-type burp guns used by the North Koreans and later the Chinese, having more than twice their muzzle energy. In intense cold, however, such as the Chosin battle, Light weapons such as the carbine and air-cooled 30 caliber light machine gun malfunctioned much more often than the M1 and the water-cooled heavies with any freeze in their jackets. The Marines used alcohol-based hair tonic as antifreeze lubricants for all light weapons, with good success, but the carbine components were small and fragile and repeatedly malfunctioned. The Thompson was used in World War II in the hands of Allied troops as a weapon for scouts, non-commissioned officers, and patrol leaders. In the European theater, the gun was utilized in British and Canadian commando units, as well as the U.S. Army paratroopers and Ranger battalions, who used it widely because of its high rate of fire, its stopping power, and because it was very effective in close combat. In the Pacific Theater, Australian Army Infantry and other Commonwealth forces initially used the Thompson extensively in jungle patrols and ambushes, where it was prized for its firepower. The U.S. Marines also used the Thompson as a limited-issue weapon, especially during their later island assaults. The Thompson was soon found to have limited effect in heavy jungle cover. By the time of the Korean War, the Thompson had seen use by the U.S. and South Korean military. Many Thompsons were distributed to Chinese armed forces as military aid before the fall of Chiang Kai-shek's government to Mao's communist forces in 1949. During the Korean War, American troops were surprised to encounter Chinese communist troops heavily armed with Thompsons, especially during surprise night assaults. The gun's ability to deliver large quantities of short-range automatic assault fire proved very useful in both defense and assault during the early part of the conflict. 
Many of these weapons were captured and placed into service with American soldiers and Marines for the balance of the war. The initial version of the Browning Automatic Rifle, BAR, was first used in combat by American soldiers during World War I, and many saw service in World War II. The BAR received high praise for its reliability under adverse conditions. The Army Infantry Squad of nine men was tactically organized around a single BAR. The Marine Squad of 13 men was organized around three fire teams each organized around a BAR. The BAR was a popular weapon in World War II and Korea because it was very reliable and offered an excellent combination of rapid fire and penetrating power. The BAR's only serious drawbacks were its lack of a quick change barrel to reduce the chance of overheating and its weight. The BAR with bipod and a loaded bandolier came to about 40 pounds. In Korea, the much greater range and penetrating power of the BAR and the 30 caliber air-cooled machine gun firing rifle ammunition usually more than offset the lightweight and rapid fire capability of the variety of submachine guns the North Koreans and Chinese used. The principal source of armament for the NK and, after the first year also, for the CCF, was Soviet Russia. Just as the U.S. provided 90% of all munitions used by U.N. forces, Russia designed, mass-produced, and delivered the bulk of all communist weapons. As with the U.S., the majority of Russian equipment was World War II vintage. Russian weaponry, as with Russian equipment generally, had one marked characteristic. It was extremely rugged, of the simplest design, consistent with efficiency, and very easy to maintain, making it suitable for the equipping of peasant armies. Despite its simplicity and lack of refinement, it was good. Communist forces were equipped with an assortment of shoulder weapons from the Russian 7.62 mm carbine, a bolt-action rifle of 1944 vintage, to Japanese 7.7 mm Imperial Army rifles taken by the Soviets from the Kwantung Army in 1945 and turned over to the CCF. The tendency of communist armies was to discard the rifle in favor of the submachine gun, less accurate and less killing power but capable of throwing a much higher volume of fire in the hands of unskilled personnel. Designed during World War II, the PPS H-41 submachine gun indicated the Soviet belief that highly accurate small arms were wasted in the hands of ground troops, while a large volume of fire was a requisite. Cheap to make, simple to operate, and thoroughly reliable under any battlefield conditions, the Soviet submachine gun was the best of its class made during World War II. Fired either full or semi-automatic, it held a magazine of 72 rounds. With a cyclic rate of 700 to 900 rounds per minute, it was inaccurate except at close range. Tokarev semi-automatic 7.62 mm, fitted with flash hider and bipod, served a purpose similar to the U.S. BAR, although less effectively. Chinese hand grenades were of similar classes as the U.S., but different in physical appearance. Their stick fragmentation grenade was less powerful, and their stick concussion grenade more powerful. On offense, the CCF ordinarily employed one platoon armed only with grenades, preparing the way for an assault platoon armed with burp guns. Since they were adept at moving close to a position at night and striking suddenly, their attacks were of great violence. Mm -hmm. 
several varieties of light machine guns were used by the NK and the CCF, together with the Guryanev heavy machine gun, which was wheel mounted. Russian machine guns were generally 7.62 millimeter, an excellent military cartridge. On the eve of the Korean War, the U.S. military had approximately 3,400 M24 light tanks in its inventory. Most of them were unserviceable or stripped for spare parts. In addition, there were available approximately 3,200 M4A3E8 Sherman medium tanks of World War II vintage, of which only a few more than half were serviceable. When the war began in June 1950, the four American infantry divisions on occupation duty in Japan had no medium tanks at all, having only one active tank company equipped with M24 Chafee light tanks each. Colonel Joseph Gallagher remembered getting the word that he was about to go to war. At my level, you didn't really see the art, hear the art. You, just, you were just told what was going to happen. So yeah, I remember that night, nobody was overly excited about it. Really didn't have too much regard for them. When these divisions were sent to Korea at the end of June 1950, they soon found that the 75 millimeter gun on the M24 could not penetrate the armor of North Korean T-34 tanks, which had no difficulty penetrating the M24's thin armor. Although no armored divisions were sent because the initial response from battlefield commanders was, Korea isn't good tank country, six army infantry divisions and one marine division were deployed. Each army infantry division should have had one divisional tank battalion of 69 tanks, and each army infantry regiment should have had a company of 22 tanks. The marine division had a tank battalion of 70 gun tanks and nine combination flamethrower howitzer tanks, and each Marine Infantry Regiment had an anti-tank platoon with five tanks each. Tanks were in such short supply, the 70th Tank Battalion at Fort Knox, Kentucky had pulled World War II Memorial M26s off of pedestals and reconditioned them for use. The 1st Marine Division at Camp Pendleton, California had all M4A3 howitzer tanks, which were replaced with M26s just days before boarding ships for Korea. A total of 309 M26 Pershings were rushed to Korea in 1950. The Pershing and its derivative M46 Patton were credited with almost half of the North Korean T-34s destroyed by U.S. tanks. Being underpowered and unreliable in the mountainous Korean terrain, all M26s were withdrawn from Korea during 1951 and replaced with M4A3 Shermans and M46 Pattons. The M46 Patton was an M26 upgrade in engine reliability and cooling system. The only extensive combat use of the M46 was in the Korean War. On August 8, 1950, the first M46 Patton tanks landed in South Korea. The tank proved superior to the much lighter North Korean T-34-85, which was encountered in relatively small numbers. By the end of 1950, 200 M46 Pattons had been fielded, forming about 15% of U.S. tank strength in Korea. Subsequent shipments of M46 and M46A1 Pattons allowed all remaining M26 Persians to be withdrawn during 1951, and most Sherman-equipped units were also re-equipped.
The North Korean invasion of South Korea in June 1950 was spearheaded by a full armored brigade equipped with about 120 T-34-85s. Additional T-34 tanks later joined the first assault force after it had penetrated into South Korea. They were pitted against the M-24 Chafee, M-4 Sherman, and M-26 Persian, but not the Centurion tanks of the UN forces. We moved over uh, to Tegu area, northeast or northwest of Tegu, and then pretty rapidly pushed back into the Tegu area. The 70th tank was there by that time, the area we pulled back into, and the transfers took place because the M24 wasn't effective against the T-34. It wasn't effective against a 51 caliber anti-tank rifle to penetrate the sides of it. So it was, it was good to keep shrapnel off of you, but not much else. The North Korean 105th Armored Brigade had overwhelmingly early successes against South Korean infantry, Task Force Smith, and US M24 light tanks. The World War II era 2.36 inch bazookas still used by the Americans were useless against the T-34s. The T-34 had an 85mm gun on it. Uh, it was a fairly good gun. Uh, it wasn't as good as a 90. And their fire control was not as good as ours. Now they used a, a Stadia range finder, which, you know, something is this big at 100 meters, it's that big at 500 meters, and that big at 1,000 meters. So you put a little curved line in a baseline. Put the baseline on the bottom of the target, assuming it's 10 feet tall, and just traverse until it touches the top line, that's the range to it. It's, you know, pretty, pretty simplistic system. And they, uh, they, they kept things simple as much as they could. T-34 was a simple tank. You know, crescent range of a pair of pliers, you keep the thing running forever. But they believed in that. And our training and our equipment, especially our fire control, I think uh, was far superior to theirs. The North Korean T-34s lost their momentum when faced with U.S. M-26 heavy tanks and ground attack aircraft. And when the U.S. infantry upgraded their anti-tank weapons to 3.5-inch super bazookas, hurriedly airlifted from the United States. The Su-76M virtually replaced infantry tanks in the close support role among communist forces. Its thin armor and open top made it vulnerable to anti-tank weapons, grenades, and small arms. Its low weight and low ground pressure gave it good mobility. The Su-76 combined three main battlefield roles, light assault gun, mobile anti-tank weapon, and mobile gun for indirect fire. Although the open compartment was highly vulnerable to small arms fire and hand grenades, it very often saved the crew's lives in the case of a hit by a bazooka whose concussion blast would mean death in an enclosed vehicle. After the counter-invasion by the Chinese Communist forces, the conflict became a defensive war of attrition. Despite mountainous terrain and restricted traffic capability, tanks proved to be potent adjuncts in support of infantry. Often, they were used for indirect fire missions or deployed in fixed defensive positions. The neglect of armor research and development and a makeshift organization led to many frustrations for tankers in Korea who fought and died there while employing, in most cases, worn out World War II equipment. This experience was a clear example of the importance of readiness and the need to modernize organization, training, and equipment to deal with the ever-changing threats and technical advances of war. Fortunately, the lesson learned in the Forgotten War led to the development of the best tank in history, the M1A Abrams.